Hello, uh, this is chapter 12, Sex and Culture for Sociology 103. <clears throat> our cultural context shapes our attitudes about sex, including how we perceive emotional commitments, the psychology of our sexual activities, and how we apply our spiritual beliefs about sex. And keep in mind that cultural context is the circumstances in which we live. So when we think about the term cultural context, you have to take into account how you were raised, the expectations your parents placed on you, the expectations your school placed on you, the expectations of your peers, and so on and so forth. The main point here is that everyone is different in their attitudes about sex because we've all been raised with different contexts. Even people who are in the same family could have different contexts because being the firstborn is going to put a lot more expectation on you than the lastborn. So when we think about sexuality, we have to keep in mind that it's a very fluid experience for people because most of us have unique experiences. Ultimately, our perception of sex is rooted in social norms, values, and institutions, much like all the other major aspects of our life. It's all about our social experience. So just to review some definitions, first we have the term sexual orientation, which is the attraction people feel for a specific gender. And we count four different kinds. We have heterosexual, which is attraction to the opposite sex. We have bisexual, which is attraction to both sexes. We have homosexual, which is attraction to the same sex. And then we have the term asexual, which means that a person has no sexual attraction to either sex. And um, in recent years, the asexual movement has been growing. Um, you know, some people choose to refrain from sexual activity, um, but a lot of people just have very low sex drives and are not really looking for a relationship. Then we have something called sexual identity, and this is a complicated definition. Because it's the identity the person develops based on their sexual relationships. Um, it describes a perception of his or, her, his or her own sex rather than their sexual orientation. So, for example, a man who feels attraction to other men may not be comfortable calling himself gay. So he labels himself as heterosexual and then may or may not be having um, homosexual relationships on the side. The picture there on the right hand side is a news story that came out several years ago. The gentleman with the mustache is named George Recker and he is an anti-gay activist who testified against gay people adopting and he was caught with a male escort and that's the young shirtless guy on the right. Recker's claim that he hired the young man from rentboys.com to carry his luggage and to give him an occasional massage. Um, rentboys.com is essentially an escort service catering to homosexual men. So, you know, what we have here is a guy who is so self-loathing that he has gone out of his way to deny happy gay people with adopting children in order to fulfill his own twisted need to manifest his self-hatred. Um, and then he goes off to Europe with his male escort. So there you go. Also, we have gender roles. Um, this is the set of social and behavioral norms that are generally considered appropriate for each gender. And gender identity, one's definition of self as a man or a woman. And here's a wonderful little scale on the spectrum of where you or people you know might fall. You know, one is ultra feminine and 12 is ultra masculine. The vast majority of us fit somewhere in the middle 
because we don't necessarily go out, you know, girls wearing dresses all the time and guys don't go out um, to the gym every day. So um, what we have to think about is how one defines oneself. So let's talk about the social forces that affect sexuality. We have sexual attitudes and behaviors that vary in different cultural uh, contexts. So, for example, in certain cultures, women do not believe that orgasm exists. Um, It is usually in societies that um, often practice genital mutilation on women, meaning they cut off their clitoris and part of their vulva, um, or there are some very conservative religious communities where they literally have sex between a sheet with a hole in it um, and it's really for procreation purposes only. Then we have sexual attitudes and behaviors that change over time and the example the prevalence of sexual activity before marriage now compared to 50 years ago. So 50 years ago approximately 48% of Americans had premarital sex at age 20. In 2002, that number had jumped 27% to 75% of Americans having premarital sex by age 20. So what we see here is a huge jump in premarital sexual activity um, over the last 50 years. And again, part of this is the attitudes change, the culture changes, people no longer are afraid of getting pregnant necessarily if they are using birth control. Um, And the concept of our attitudes changing and our behavior changing is, remember, part of our social experience. Things change, and as such, um, society changes very slowly over the long term. Then sexual identity is learned. Um, children role play. They play house, they play doctor. Um, the idea here is that they're not just learning their gender roles and what is expected of them, but they're also learning how to interact with each other in a sexual way. And I don't mean that, you know, seven year olds are actually having sex with each other, but rather they're beginning to understand the differences in each other's bodies. And as such, that curiosity will lead them eventually into a more Um, sexual perspective eventually. Social institutions define and direct human sexuality. So religion tells us when we can have sex. Roman Catholics are not supposed to have sex except to procreate. Um, Our family, you know, a lot of families, mom and dad don't want you having sex before marriage. The media, on the other hand, you know, with the amount of sex that goes on on certain TV shows, you would think that everyone is having sex on a daily basis six or seven times a day. Sex is influenced by economic forces in society. So sex is used in advertising and um, oftentimes you won't even notice it or it'll fly right by your attention because we're so inundated with these images of, you know, incredibly provocative scenarios. Additionally, pornography is a $10 billion a year business. You know, 30 years ago, 40 years ago, 25 years ago, if you wanted to look at pornography, you had to go into one of those little weird stores that are by the highway and buy your pornography. Um, Nowadays, you power up your computer, and there it is. And probably a thousand times more varied than anything that ever um, was published in print. Government policies regulate our sexual and reproductive behaviors. So a lot of states control the funding for sex ed, and they determine what kind of information is being taught. And then you also see the federal government prohibiting spending on abortion for women who are on welfare. And again, what this is saying is that a person who is on welfare and who has a pregnancy either due to not using birth control or rape or any other number of things that could happen 
cannot get an abortion paid for. So, you know, we, we look at these things and it doesn't impact us very much, so we don't think about it too much. But it really does have a significant impact on our lives. Attitudes about sex are impacted by our age, by our gender, by our religious affiliation, our political affiliation, and our location. Um, people who are in the city tend to be much more liberal in their perspective than the people who are in the country. Um, the suburbs is a melting pot. You have very conservative, very liberal uh, people living together. And, you know, again, what you see here is how society influences itself. And over there on the right hand side is a percent is a, a chart telling us how Americans feel about certain issues. So the stuff in orange, the number in orange is the num the percent of people who feel that this particular element is wrong. So eighty four percent of people believe extramarital affairs are wrong. 49% believe abortion is wrong, 37% believe in homosexuality is wrong, 30% of people believe that premarital sex is wrong, 24% with gambling, 22% with divorce, 16% with alcohol use, and 7% with contraceptive use. And what you see here is a pretty varied perspective on things. Um, you know, something like for example, divorce is seen as pretty acceptable in society. And yet, 22% or, you know, one in five basically feel that divorce is wrong. So, again, we, because we live on the East Coast, tend to be a little bit more liberal in our perspectives. So, maybe some of these, especially the divorce, alcohol use, and gambling, may seem a little uh, absurd. So, how often are Americans having sex? Um, married people have more sex than single people. Um, between 18 and 29, they have, married people have sex about eight times a month, 30 to 39, seven times a month, and 40 to 59, about six times a month. Whereas single people tend to have sex about six times per month. So, you know, this is one of those things that we look at and we say, you know, single people may have variety, but married people have quantity. Then we have an interesting um, context with friends with benefits. And it's a new, uh, relatively new concept in the last 10 or so years. Um, and this is when you engage in sexual relationships with a friend who you have shared history of non-sexual interactions and there is some level of emotional closeness and intimacy. The major risk is losing that person as a friend after the sex ends and about 15 percent become actual real relationships. Um, a couple years ago we had two movies that come out around the same time. We had Friends with Benefits with Justin Timberlake and Mila Kunis and then we had No Strings Attached with um, Ashton Kutcher and Natalie Portman and both of these movies turned the relationship into love stories but that generally is not how it goes. Um, and then the middle chart is the status of a friendship after the friends with benefits relationship ends and you know the vast majority of people manage to stay friends they may not be as close but they still manage to maintain a friendship now why is friends with benefits so popular and it really comes down to this when young people in their 20s are busy with school work family stuff they oftentimes don't have a lot of time to date. So instead of playing, you know, gambling on a relationship with somebody that you just met, finding someone that you have a regular physical relationship with, no strings attached, so to speak, um, it seems like a good way to um, manage your sexual urges without having to worry about cultivating a relationship. Now let's talk about marriage and infidelity. Approximately 95% of the U.S. population will get married or have a domestic partnership in their lifetime. 
According to a 2004 University Chicago study, 25% of married men have had at least one extramarital affair. And then according to a 2007 poll conducted by NBC News, 18% of women have had at least one extramarital affair. So men about one in four, women about one in five. So clearly what we're seeing here is that people choose oftentimes to stay monogamous but there is a hefty portion of uh, marriages out there where where one or both partners have had extramarital affairs and it doesn't always lead to divorce it's sometimes a midlife crisis a um, crisis of you know you fall for somebody who pays attention to you and um, brings you little gifts and things like that so a lot of times it's not meant to be a love affair as much as fulfilling some sort of need that is not being met in the marriage so what do sociologists say about sexuality functionalists see sexuality in terms of how it contributes to the stability of social institutions. So, for example, the norms that encourage monogamy encourage the stability of the family. Life is easier when there is mom, dad, or other mom, and kids. You know, when there is only one parent, the workload doubles. And as a consequence, it's often very difficult to maintain a healthy family environment um, in a single parent household. It's not impossible and there's a lot of wonderful single parents out there, but it's just easier to have two parents in the house. Um, and then regulating sexual behavior reduces instability and conflict. So remember, functionalists are all about maintaining homeostasis and for them, these norms and regulations maintain the status quo. Now, conflict theorists see sexuality as part of the power dynamic and economic inequality in society. So, for example, rape is the result of power imbalances between men and women. Um, sexual norms are challenged by those who are oppressed by the majority. So sex before marriage in the 1960s was challenged by the hippie movement who were pretty much young people who did not have the right to vote um, because at the time the voting age was 21 but they were getting sent off to Vietnam. So um, you know they changed a lot of the norms because they rejected wholeheartedly the entire context of the previous generation's expectations. Then we have the symbolic interactionists who believe that culture and society shape our sexual experience. So for example, coming out as gay is a process for most people and it is a matter of moving towards finding out who you really are, which is part of our adolescent experience. So ultimately, sexual norms emerge through social interactions and construction of beliefs. Then we have sexual politics, and this is the link between sexuality and power. So this includes the status of women in society, domestic and sexual violence against women, violence against sexual minorities, and the recognition of the power and privilege given to those in a dominant group. So, you know, women are oftentimes beaten up by their partners. And um, on the right-hand side on the pictures, you'll see uh, a man who is bleeding. And he was one of the um, gay guys who was beaten up in Philly in the summer of 2014. And again, people were shocked. Not only is Philadelphia the city of brotherly love, it's also, you know, part of the East Coast liberal perspective on things that live and let live. And to know that a group of white people beat up two gay guys, it was just shocking for a lot of people. So a lot of this comes down to a 
particular trend, which is the double standard. The idea that there are different standards for sexual behavior for men and women. Studies have shown that men with a high number of sexual partners tend to be more popular, whereas women with a high number of sexual partners tend to be less popular. And, you know, and again, in our society, we see a guy who has sex with a lot of different women as a stud, and women who have sex with a lot of different partners as a slut. And, you know, that perspective alone tells us, the language tells us how society feels about these particular actions. Women who are sexually adventuresome are seen as shameful. And this is why women who are raped are often viewed with suspicion, as if they encourage their behavior. They wore a short skirt, or they smiled at a guy. Well, that's not sexual, you know, that's not sexual. That could just be incidental. Um, and yet women are often blamed for their own rape. According to a survey of adults aged 20 to 59, women have an average of four sexual partners during their lifetime and men have an average of seven sexual partners. Now, if those numbers seem low, again, it's certain expectations are placed on us, not just by society's uh, institutions, but also on a, by our peers. Women are socialized in the United States to see sexuality as a way to maintain affection and build intimacy with our partners. Whereas men are often stereotyped as being unable to control their sexual urges. And men are socialized in the United States to see sexuality in terms of performance and achievement. You know, it's that whole idea of winning. And whereas a woman wants to cuddle, a guy needs to win. And again, this is how we in society perceive things. It doesn't mean that's how they are necessarily with every single person. In most cities that run sting operations, women are arrested for prostitution, but the men are not arrested who are looking for the prostitutes. Based on estimates, only 10% of prostitution arrests are towards the customers. So it would be as if only drug dealers got arrested and the people buying the drugs never got arrested and we know that doesn't happen um, on the left you'll see two pictures one is the Hollywood madam Heidi Fleiss and she was convicted of pandering which is a nice way of saying pimping and tax evasion and she served two years in jail um, Charlie Sheen on the right hand side is a frequent and vocal customer of prostitutes and he has never been arrested for um, using their services although he was arrested for beating up his wife but that's a different issue so let's look at teen sexuality next in the United States the culture surrounding teen sexuality is that it is to be discouraged and is seen as dangerous Yet our teen pregnancy rate is one of the highest in the developed world. So Bulgaria, which really is not that developed, quite frankly, um, is at 42. And the United States is at 39. Now what that means is, and if you look at the bottom x-axis, live births per 1,000 females aged 15 to 19. That's a pretty significant number. Almost 4%. On the other hand, in the Netherlands, teen sexuality is accepted by parents as a natural part of growing up, and opposite gender sleepovers are fairly common for 16 and 17 year olds. And they have one of the lowest teen pregnancy rates in the world. So part of it is, in this country, we have made, we've demonized teen sexuality. You know, it has to be hidden, it has to be on the uh, kept quiet, you know, backseat of the car. Um, and as a consequence to that, you know, people don't take the right precautions, you know. Using condoms, using birth control is so simple, and yet we have this horrifically high teen birth rate in this country. And when they look at the sexual activity in other countries, we are comparable. So, you know, teenagers 
all over the world are still having sex, but some are more careful than others. The highest rates of teen pregnancy are in the south and southwest of the United States. The first highest is Mississippi, and it's followed by New Mexico. The lowest rate for teen pregnancy is in New England, so, and the lowest rate in the country is in New Hampshire. So let's, you know, one would have to ask oneself, why is that? And we'll get to that in a minute, but first, some more statistics. 370,000 babies are born to girls under the age of 19 each year in the United States. 82% of teen pregnancies are unplanned and usually due to inconsistent use of birth control. Teen birth rates, interestingly, have been declining in the last 20 years, but much more rapidly for African American girls than white girls. So, you know, clearly what we're seeing is the um, African American young girls are getting the message to use birth control, to be healthy about um, having sex in a positive way, whereas the young white girls are not. Teenage pregnancy correlates strongly with the following. Poverty, lower educational attainment, and over there on the right, you'll see just 38% of teen girls who, get a who have a child before 18 get a high school diploma. That is horrifying to think that. Um, you know, 62% of young women who have a child before 18 literally have put themselves in a scenario where they will not have an opportunity to climb out of poverty. Also, they deal with joblessness, health issues, and babies are more likely to be born underweight. And part of the reason for that is that oftentimes young teens are reluctant to tell anyone that they think they're pregnant. They are ambivalent about the child. Um, they don't follow the doctor's prescriptions for taking certain kinds of vitamins, for managing their sleep schedules, for any of those things that um, an older woman takes much more seriously. So the babies tend to be underweight. Another issue is that teens are often reluctant to quit smoking because they perceive their smoking as part of their identity and again smoking while you're pregnant can cause your child to be born underweight so a lot of this boils down to the idea of sex education in schools and one of the big thrusts in the last 14 or 15 years has been this idea of abstinence only sex education and this is Students are encouraged to refrain from sexual activity until they get married. So, in other words, they don't really focus on condom use. They don't focus on how to avoid pregnancy. They're telling people to just say no. During the Bush presidency, funding for abstinence education, sex education, tripled. So, there was a huge push from 2000 to 2008 to get rid of comprehensive sex ed and instead replace it with just say no. Now, in 2009, Rosenbaum published the largest study on the effectiveness of abstinence-only sex ed. And what they found is that there is no difference in the number of times the teenagers had sex, the age of first sexual encounter, and the practice of oral and anal sex meaning that people learn about abstinence but they don't practice it um, and it's that kind of thing where they don't get the good information they're just being told they should say no so they may intend to say no but hormones and peer pressure and media pressure and all that other stuff goes in and they're saying yes but they're not being safe about it Abstinent only teens are also less likely to use birth control. Um, and then other findings have included that they are abstinent only education. Oftentimes they'll refrain from vaginal sex, but they will oftentimes have oral and anal sex. So, um, you know, they've kind of parsed the definition of sex into what they will accommodate. 
Comprehensive sex education has been shown to delay the age of first sexual experience. In the United States, the approximate age of losing one's virginity is about 17. Um, so, you know, the vast majority of sex ed states tend to provide extremely good comprehensive education about this stuff. However, you also see a lot of those states in gray where you know sex ed is really not being provided so mississippi for example requires abstinence only sex ed now notice the states that have the um stripes in them those are the states that require sex ed must be medically accurate that means in states that do not have those stripes they don't have to be accurate about their sex ed so you hear things like you can't get pregnant the first time you have sex or you can't get pregnant if you're standing up or you can't get pregnant if you're in a swimming pool and the you know the fact of the matter is you can but a lot of times the person who is giving the sex ed talk has little or no accurate information to provide so we're going to finish this chapter talking about homosexuality Heterosexism is the belief that heterosexual behavior is the only natural form of sexual expression and that homosexuality is a perversion of normal sexual identity. This is encouraged by many of the social and legal institutions in the United States and consequently the gay community has developed their own institutional support systems such as gay pride events and gay professional organizations. Um, and remember, when we have minorities, they tend to work together to create economic, social, and financial opportunities for one another. Um, you know, and, and the idea that there is only one type of sexuality that is allowed has been counterintuitive, not just with history, but if you look at the animal kingdom. And that's really what... Um, a lot of researchers are saying that if homosexuality exists in the animal kingdom, then it's a natural element. Gay people in relationships do not stere adopt stereotypical male and female roles. Um, they are much more likely to be equal in their sense of responsibility. So you don't have a boy and a girl in a um, gay relationship. You have two equals. Also, they are more likely to both be employed, which provides more equality in a relationship and a better socioeconomic status. The fact of the matter is, is that when two gay men become partners, they are going to make a heck of a lot more money than any other kind of couple because men tend to make more money. So what we see here is a um, <clears throat> marketing opportunity for a lot of the big companies and you will see them advertising um, for gay couples because they have money to spend and when it comes to marketers and products and capitalism they don't care who you sleep with. So we're going to finish up talking about some of the legal issues of homosexuality. The lesbian, gay, bisexual, transsexual, and queer community are denied equal rights and are singled out for negative treatment by society. However, in 1996, the Supreme Court ruled that gays and lesbians cannot be denied equal protection under the law. However, as of today, many states do not offer or support gay marriage, domestic partner benefits, or gay adoption. As of December 2014, there are 35 states that permit gay marriage, and court cases are pending in several others. And really what it boils down to is, if a person who is over 18 is a responsible mature adult you cannot say to them as an American citizen that you are not equal to everyone else in the country and that's what these rights these lack of rights have done for the gay community for years is saying you are not equal so when you have someone like Sally Ride who was a famous astronaut who was lesbian and when she died 
it came out that she was gay, um, the fact of the matter was her partner of 20 years did not get any of her pension benefits because they could not get married. And that's really something that is very sad for a lot of relationships that depend upon one partner for the financial well-being. So that's going to end today's presentation. If you have any questions, please feel free to text or email me and have a terrific day. Thank you.